Homefront is a first-person shooter. It's set in the year 2027. One of the main hooks of Homefront is its premise. It's an Occupation USA setting. Homefront's an opportunity for us to tell a story that's near and dear to our hearts, an environment that's very familiar, but has been warped beyond recognition. It's a story of really survival and adaptation. What it feels like to be part of a resistance fighting for your country, to give the last full measure for something that you really believe in. In a lot of other games, you know, you blow into a place, you know, a slum or something like that, and you kill 100 people, and at the end of the level, you jump into a helicopter and fly away. You know, at the end of our levels, there's no helicopter. You have to stay and live with the things that you did. Bringing 2027 to life in kind of a suburban and rural setting all comes down to uh, picking the things that everybody's extremely familiar with. The buckets are now water collectors. The children's toys are still there, but they might just be repurposed for something else. This is a survivalist nation now. Now it's about being a member of a resistance cell in occupied America and doing what it takes to liberate your country from this alien oppressor. The idea for Hope Front actually came from a few different angles, really. Uh, one of them was Red Dawn. You know, I watched that and that was very inspirational. John Milius is like a great American film creator. Apocalypse Now, Red Dawn, and Conan. He's just the type of guy that has this natural creative ability. He just knows when something's good. And he really brings like 30 years of storytelling experience to us. Speculative fiction basically means we are giving the audience what-if situations. What if America was invaded by Korea? What if this happened? And then filling out the answers to that, and that's really where the high premise of Homefront comes from. We said, what if USA was occupied? What would it be like to experience that future? Historically, there are multiple examples of sudden rises and sudden falls. Ancient Greece, Mongolia, Japan. So when you say, how could a mighty power like the USA fall, it's, it's really a combination of elements. It's the decline of the USA due to internal factors and global geopolitical situation. And there's a war in the Middle East, there's Saudi Arabia and Iran involved, and that disrupts oil supplies. And the rise of a new power. The United States' big weakness is their just-in-time economy. Your local supermarket has three days worth of stocks on the shelves. If something gets in the way and disrupts that, that's it for our country. You know, our country is on the razor's edge. The North Koreans are the perfect enemy. The only North Korean that anybody knows is Kim Jong-il. This morning comes the news of Kim Jong-il's death. <laughs> North Koreans greet their new supreme leader, Kim Jong-un. The North Koreans actually have the world's fourth largest standing army, which a lot of people don't know about. Now, what happens in the storyline is that we have North Korea being unified with South Korea to form one country where it has the economic power and modern military equipment. And within the storyline, we also have North Korea uh, being in conflict with Japan and training on American weapons and getting a lot of modern training and really building up a military from the other countries in the East Asia region. North Korea is able to invade the United States through its well-prepared uh, military strikes uh, that involves a EMP strike. EMP is an electromagnetic pulse. It sends out a particular type of energy that blankets the Earth and what that does is it deactivates modern electronics. You see things that aren't supposed to be happening, you know, this little town main street and it's got ma and pa shops and bakeries and banks, but there's soldiers and there's barbed wire. And that's kind of the genesis of where this phrase, the familiar has become alien, has come from. We want to show America, but twisted. War in the back suburbs, war in the elementary school playgrounds, baseball fields, high school. Golden Gate Bridge becomes a battlefield. That's pretty darn alien if you ask me. It takes seeing an enemy hurting innocent people in front of you to make you understand why you're doing the things that you're doing. This is your backyard. This is, this is literally home front. Home front multiplayer is large scale warfare. Complete and total bedlam. Epic vehicular warfare. Fast paced, exciting, and fun. Home front multiplayer takes place during the occupation wars. This is the time when the Korean army was invading the U.S. after a deadly EMP attack and cyber attack. The remnants of the U.S. military are kind of off, still trying to hold on and fight off uh, the Korean invasion as best they can. The battles really take place in, in various locations, from suburban cul-de-sacs to, you know, department stores to a highway interchange. So you get to experience a wider swath of America. The multiplayer design goals really stems from wanting to build a large-scale warfare experience to 
really be the category leader in that audience. Make it accessible, make it intuitive, but most of all, make it a lot of fun. So you have infantry, you have drones, you have tanks, LAVs, helicopters, all those brought together in the battlefields. There's a lot of action going on. You know, when you play home front, there's a tank rolling in, getting blown up, there's a helicopter overhead. We want to bring all those tools together into a really tight, cohesive package. What we're really trying to do is make the game play different than any FPS that you played before. The whole idea behind vehicles and home front is you should get in and start having fun right away. This is not the kind of game where you need to spend two hours learning how to fly a helicopter. Battlefronts really gives us an in-game economy. So you're doing actions in the game, and every one of those actions is earning you points. So Battle Points basically allows us to put a price on each vehicle, to put a price on every special weapon. Rather than just saying, like, oh, great, you know, you captured that objective, here's some experience, uh, we're saying, hey, you captured that objective, that's great, now here's a tank. You can buy everything from tanks, helicopters, to drones, to additional ammo for your RPG. The idea with Battle Points is buy what you want, when you want it. So if you're fighting a vehicle and you need a new rocket launcher, you can pick one up right on the fly. The near future setting uh, for Homefront gives us the ability to bring in uh, some near future technology like drones. What drones add to the game is a lot of new and interesting types of ways to, to fight your enemy and to fight them without putting yourself at risk. You know, I may spawn in the game initially and deploy my recon drone and I start marking different targets. Ground control, everyone races for these three objectives. And then when you capture an objective, you start gaining points. Now when you gain enough points, it'll actually push the whole line over to the enemy section. You're not spread out amongst a vast area. You feel the infantry style combat, that intense battle for the objective points, as well as have the epic vehicular warfare reign in it. Ground control is different from other objective-based game modes because you get to fight over new spaces. The objectives will move to different locations, and you'll have to use new strategies when you get to those areas. So in essence, you're, you're not just playing on the same map for 12 to 15 minutes, you're playing on two or three different maps because all the gameplay is localized around those objective points. And as players start earning points, you're going to start seeing some tanks on the field, some helicopters. The battlefield evolves in a way that you see something different every minute that you're playing. Homefront is doing dedicated servers. In console games, you can get up to 32 players. In PC, obviously, it's even more important to have dedicated servers. After Homefront ships, I'm probably gonna kick back by playing Homefront and destroying noobs online. It's interesting, as a developer, you have pretty much like one day where you know a lot more than everyone else at the game. After that one day, you're getting your ass kicked like everyone else. The thing that I'm most excited about in Homefront is this unique core fantasy. The idea that you know we're exploring the civilian side and the human side. The main gameplay goal behind the single player portion of our game was to put the player in the shoes of a resistant soldier fighting for his country. Everything that we did comes out of that. How your weapons work, how you relate to the world, the kind of missions that you go on, it all comes from that. You know, in a lot of shooters you have the best equipment and great number of allies and an army behind you. In this case, you're civilians turned freedom fighters and you have to fight against this greater force that has better equipment than you do. And it's really a sort of get in, get out situation. It's an interesting place for us to be on this one because everybody's expectations is military shooter, military shooter. We want guys who are professional. But, you know, guys who are really professional in war are like robots. Uh, and for us, they're not professional military people, they're resistance fighters, they're all civilians. When it comes down to realizing this, this world, this fallen America, this occupied America in the game, we really wanted to establish some key moments or key shots where you come out of an opening and you see this big, huge, expansive environment revealed before you. You see this, this enormous vista of this plane that crashed when the EMP went off. It's kind of like this moment where you're like, this is really something different. It's really spectacular. We really want people to feel like this looks like a place that I grew up in and then twist it and now it looks abandoned, now it looks collapsed. The second thing which I think has been a huge win for us overall is going after real world brands. We really want to get these brands in here because they're part of the fabric of American life. So one of the places that the Koreans use as a supply depot was a classic big box store and they sort of move in and they use the big space to store all their military stuff. And it's one of our big set pieces where the military goes on uh, a raid mission to steal a bunch of fuel. Consequence of violence is something that, that we're focusing on in the game. You know, war is not a pretty thing, and there's not always lots of positive events that come out of it. It's actually very dark and tragic, and we want to show that element in Homefront, which you don't really get in a lot of shooters. Jay, just put them out of there, Missouri. Oh, shooting! I've got a 
average FPS, you'll blow through 30 to 100 guys every 15 to 20 minutes or so. And you sort of get this, um, this what we call massacre fatigue. When you, you stop even caring, you don't even realize that you're, you're killing humans. But what we're trying to do is really attach a motion to that, that it actually, uh, there are consequences to violence. Please form a simple follow-up. Have your papers ready for inspection. How am I supposed to make the player feel or care about the fact that they're killing when that's the whole goal of the game? But that's really the fundamental crux of what we're trying to achieve. Your character in the game, his name is Robert Jacobs. He's a former pilot. He's recruited by the resistance because they need a helicopter pilot. So Boone is a former police officer. He's the leader of the current resistance cell and sort of the father figure of the whole unit. He's less about killing the Koreans and more about what can I do to free my people. Connor is really the, the key combat figure of the group. He's, he's a little on the wild side. He's not conventional, but he's really a valuable man to have in a fight. And Rihanna is born and raised in upstate New York. She was kind of the hunter in the wilderness, and she just felt the call to, to join the resistance and do whatever she could about it. The final character is Hopper. What makes him really interesting is he's a Korean-American, and he has scars on his face from race riots that happened in the early parts of the war. The supporting cast is kind of interesting because you run across all these civilians who have totally different approaches. Some will work with you, some will support you, others might betray you or sell you out, and we create all these kind of neat moments around all these supporting characters. You're a guy who is caught up in this crazy scenario, fighting alongside other people who have no real training. So, you know, you make mistakes. You know, people get shot, people get hurt. People die alongside you. Fighting the civilian with civilian in, in an occupied America, that's really the core of what Homefront's all about. And that's really what we're set to deliver on.